Great. Thanks for the countdown. Hello, everybody. Um, and welcome to RBCM at Outside. Hang on a second. I'm just going to position my camera so I can see Gavin. Oh, I can't see Gavin. He's just never mind. Welcome, everybody, to RBCM Outside. Um, my name is Liz Crocker, and I'm a learning program developer on the learning team at the Royal BC Museum. And um, I'm here today for an RBCM at Outside program where we attempt to combine an outdoor field trip with an online program using technology that um, uh, sometimes causes us challenges, sometimes not. Um, I think we've got a pretty good connection here today, so hopefully we're, we'll be good. Um, so in the background there, you might see uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Gavin Hankey, and he's uh, going to be part of the program today, as well as Heidi Gartner. And um, but before we get to all that, I just want to tell you about a few things coming up. So, oh, but first of all, I would like to acknowledge, of course, that um, where I am, and we were guessing for the folks that were here in the room before. Um, I'm, I'm right here at Clover, po Clover Point, it's called, which is uh, within the city limits of City Victoria. Um, and it actually looks out across the Juan de Fuca, straight over at uh, Port Angeles in the States. And uh, there's a rocky, rocky uh, intertidal zone here with all kinds of um, diversity of, of animals. And so that's where we're going to be taking a look today. But where we are here is within the territory of uh, the Lekwungen speaking people, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And so as ever, I'm very grateful to be working here and learning and uh, standing here on this beautiful, beautiful place. Um, and also, I would like to acknowledge, because maybe you're watching this later on a recording, um, because we do post these later, uh, but right now it's June 2020, and there's all kinds of um, anti-racism protests going on all over the world. And um, you might think that that doesn't have anything to do with oceans or, or nature or naturalists and, and uh, folks that, that study nature, but it does. And um, there's uh, quite a bit of racism that happens um, outside with folks that are just either amateurs or professionals looking at nature and studying nature in all different kinds of ways. So if you aren't aware of that, there's um, a lot of good stuff online. And I can give you a couple of suggestions of where to start um, that I've been enjoying um, and learning so much. Um, there's an, and Chris and Wes are going to uh, post them. So if you're in social media, you can start with looking at some hashtags. So those last week was actually uh, Black Birders Week. Um, and so if you go to hashtag Black Birders Week, there's all kinds of great stuff in there. There's also a uh, hashtag Birding While Black. And my personal favorite, uh, which I just found last night, is Black Women Who Bird, which is just fantastic. If you go in there and find some of those threads, um, there's some wonderful uh, photos and conversations that are going on and just bringing awareness that even outside uh, racism is all over our society and um, it's not right anywhere. So um, the other thing I want to say is that this is an extra program. This is, we're here for Oceans Week. We usually only do this program every second week, um, but this week is Oceans Week. Uh, and we're, so we're part of Oceans Week Victoria. And so we'll be sharing a link to that. There's all kinds of other things going on, other resources. Um, and there's also an Oceans Week in Halifax going on. So I encourage you to look at all the things that are happening all over to celebrate um, the significance and uh, the wonder of our oceans. And next week, on June 17th is our next RBCM outside. And that one I'm gonna be back at the Royal BC Museum and uh, with Luann Neal, who's repatriation specialist at the museum. And she joined me for our first program a few weeks ago, many weeks ago now, uh, but she's coming back and we're gonna look at the history of Thunderbird Park out in the cultural precinct on the grounds of the museum and find out how it was transformed to what we see today, how it became what it is today with the poles and the other structures in the park. Okay, now, enough of me talking. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is uh, we've got this very short period of time where we're just going to a little, little bit of a snippet, and I'm going to um, turn it around um, and use the camera to explore outside, first with um, Dr. Gavin Hankey. There he is. <laughs> Bear with me, Gavin. And uh, we've got Heidi Gardner in the room with us. Who, um, so Gavin is the curator of vertebrate zoology at the museum, and Heidi uh, Gartner is the um, invertebrate collections manager and she's a researcher as well. And so we got her in a Zoom room uh, because we do have some invertebrates that we need uh, to have her have a look at uh, remotely, virtually. So let me turn my camera around, hopefully without making you motion sick, putting it over to Gavin. And uh, Chris will let us know if we lose connection, but otherwise, let's get started. Gavin, 
you're down here. You've been down here for a while. I know you found some things. Yeah. Where do you want to start? Well, just to describe what I was doing, just poking around in the intertidal zone here. Um, it's not a particularly low tide, so if it's even lower tide, you can get fish that are a little more uh, interesting, in my opinion, but we did get a fair few. Um, but yeah, this is barely more than knee deep water and lifting rocks that are actually on shore. So there are, there are fish on shore exposed right now, um, as well as things that are just subtitled, just within, within not even 50 centimeters of water. We just found a big fish right before we started, which I know Gavin wants to show us. And uh, yeah, so what are you looking at down here? Were you just- uh, Yeah, actually, well, I just got this have? kite in here. It's not really my deal. It's, uh, okay, it's well, invertebrate. Well, maybe we get Heidi in yeah, right away. Oh yeah, that is sneaky. Let me just, and, and Gavin and I are social distancing. Yeah, so- um, there, ooh, Okay. Yeah, yeah, so this is just on the boat ramp. At Clover Point. Very well camouflaged. Yeah. Let me try to get Heidi. Is there anything you want to say? Come on and say about a chitin. Sure. Um, so chitons are animals that are closely related to things like snails. They have this large muscular foot they crawl around on that's underneath. But instead of a shell like a snail that's coiled and on top, they have those eight plates you can kind of see right on top mm -hmm. that Liz had touched there. And that's how they protect themselves instead is they have these eight plates. And when they get dislodged in the intertidal, they can roll up into a ball and those eight plates protect them on the outside. And um, they're really loving this sort of environment because they have a specialized tongue that's like super hard and they basically go along and lick or rasp off algae off of rocks. So this is, you know, prime habitat for it right now. It's probably very full. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. Um, yeah. yeah, and it just, yeah, again, I'm just gonna say it again. We're so close to the city and there's so much here in terms of ocean diversity. Well, with what we we caught today, we're just tipping the iceberg here. I mean, it's just like the, the slightest bit of what, what is actually here. I didn't pick up any uh, sea cucumbers, brittle stars. There are other crabs that I just, I saw them. I didn't collect them. I found a red rock crab that was a good size. Ooh. I sent it on its way, so I didn't get my toes pinched. <laughs> um, yeah, there's tons here, and I, uh, there's snails all over the place. Okay. Do you yeah. want to show us the big fish? Let's show <laughs> So Liz, Liz, there is one question from Christian. Do you think okay. there will be, do you think there will be eels? The oh, question. that is no. an excellent question, Gavin. No, there are no eels. Why, Gavin? <laughs> because all of the eels in British Columbia are offshore and deep water. Hmm. So uh, they're open ocean fish. Uh, the eels that we have here are not inshore. We have lampreys, which are coastal and they go up into fresh water. Um, but most of what you find in the intertidal that people say is an eel is either a gunnel or a prickleback. And I've got examples of each. Because I was just going to say, but Gavin, these look like eels to, yeah, to me, exactly. a non-expert eye, right? So uh -huh. that big one, we just, I just caught that by hand. Do you hear the excitement in Gavin's voice? I couldn't believe that one. I think that's the biggest one I've ever caught. It's a black prickleback. There was, I, I think gorgeous. you squealed. I, I think, think you I actually did squeal. Did squeal. I don't think we sure have I that squealed. recorded, but. It's a shame. That would have been funny. Now this tank, I mean, this big guy's kind of hogging the entire aquarium. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to take him out. Now, what? What, okay. what makes this not an eel and same with the gunnels is that they have a spiny dorsal fin and they have a spiny anal fin. Eels don't have sp spines in any of their fins. So it's just a fundamental difference between them. These are closer to say a bass or a perch. They're a spiny rayed fish um, than they are to say uh, true eels. True eels also have a very unique, like, no, it's either unique or it's not, a unique uh, larval form called a leptocephalus, which they're translucent. They're really bizarre looking things. And these guys obviously do not have that. So it's uh, mm. the leptocephalus is unique to eels themselves. So I'm going to flip him back into okay. the... Okay, I'm going to step back this and... Going to be splash, there's going to be a splash here. This is I, I do apologize for any jerky camera. This is so rocky. Come on. Gentle, Trying gentle, to... Gentle, gentle, gentle. Wow. I don't want to hurt you. Come on. Gotcha. Thank you very much. All right. In you go. Okay, so now, what are those in there? <laughs> oh my goodness. This tub was my tub of things, sort of my doubles, if you will. Kind of like collecting baseball cards or, you know, when I was a kid, it was Star Wars cards. You got it, you got it, you got doubles. Oh, got it, got three of those, got four of those. So that's my extras. So uh -huh. those, those are the duplicates. Uh -huh. Is that big guy vegetarian? 
Uh, I hope so. Not, well, they, okay. they probably will eat, uh, I mean, to be honest, I don't know if anyone's actually studied their diet here in BC, but I, I would expect them to eat uh, mm. small fish, crustaceans. They probably do eat algae as well. Mm. So here, see now, this is the funny thing. Until I got that massive one, there was my rock prickleback. Oh yeah. Or it could be a black prickle or a rock prickleback. I'm trying to get a bit closer. Similar. It's beautiful. There's a sculpin trying to get his face in there too. But they have, it's hard to see, mm. but they got really neat little markings around the face that are, see if I can get Oh, it. that sculpin is pretty. So little, little stripes mm. around the oh, face. Yeah. And those little markings can help you identify them. But they've got tiny little fins. Um, I don't think they have any pelvic fins on these guys. No, just a dorsal fin, an anal fin, a tail, and wee stumpy little pectoral fins. Okay, and sorry, I missed it. Are these related to lampreys, did you say? No, nope, not even close. Not even close. No, okay. These are jawed fish, so jawed they're, they're closer fish. to say something okay. like a bass or a perch or even a rock oh, fish. Oh, okay, okay. They're, they're bony fish, they're spine, and they have spines in their fins, so. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see a question came across. Chris, what was that question about pricklebacks? Yeah, so the question is, is there a way to tell pricklebacks and gunnels apart? Easy, yes. It's the length of the anal fin. Of course, I was going to say. So Gavin, is it the length of the anal <laughs> fin? On a prickleback, the anal fin is at least half the length of the body. Okay, where can we, maybe, I don't know. I mean, there, my ring finger. Oh, no, oh, oh. it's right there. There, oh geez. It's very hard to see when they're moving, but the anal fin starts, you can see it's anus oh. there. So half the body length okay. has, an, has a fin on the underside. And this is a gunnel, and it's less than half of the body length for the anal fin. Less than half. Yeah, so okay. on, on a gunnel, it's less than half the body length. On a prickleback, it's, it's about half the length. And that's a saddleback gunnel. He's one of my favorites, that gorgeous little oh. fish. Yeah. Come on. Oh, those markings are beautiful. I was hoping to get you guys a crescent gunnel, which looks a lot like this. They tend to be a little more orange. And they've got little sort of dark spots with little rings around them, like crescent moon around each spot. They're beautiful little fish, but they're quite common here. I'm surprised I didn't get a crescent gunnel. Wow. And then I got a, this looks like another prickleback. This one I think is I can't remember the common name. I want to say Anoplarchus insignis. Don't quote me on that. I'd have to go look <laughs> it up. I try not to memorize if I can avoid it. And this one looks like Anoplarchus pur an purpureus, um, the high coxcomb. This one is probably the most, next next to the tide pool sculpt, and this is probably the most abundant fish out here. And oh, okay. when people see these, they go, oh yeah, it's an eel. And the mm. fact is, they're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen those lots. And I've, now, I was kind of disappointed. I only got two sculpins. This one looks like a good-sized tide pool sculpin. And then there's this little guy, which I'm going to have to get a good photograph of him to identify him. He's a beautiful little thing. Copper brown. Oh, that little is A little bit beautiful. of sparkles around his eyes. He's a pretty little thing. So yeah, very pretty. I'll photograph that one and figure out what he is. I'm really pleased with that one. Nice. Um, so that's the majority of what I've got. Normally here I can get snailfish. I can get, uh, and snailfish here, are the, the young ones are lemon yellow, they're gorgeous. And the one fish I was hoping to get, because it's coming up to breeding season, is the long fin sculpin. And they're, I've caught them here, they're about you know so big, maybe 10, 15 centimeters, but they're electric blue and red when they're in breeding dress. They're gorgeous fish. Oh, so folks could look that up. What, say yeah. the name again? Uh, the long fin sculpin. Or Jordania Zanopi is the Latin name. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing fish. There's a, there's a book that came out, I'm not sure if it was the beginning of this year or the end of last year, uh, Fishes of the Salish Sea. It's a three volume series. And the photograph or the, the drawing of, of uh, the long fin sculpin in there is fantastic. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's done by uh, Joseph Tomillary, the fish artist. So yeah, amazing stuff. Thanks, Gavin. And that's a great segue for me to say, uh, we're, we'll put a link in the Facebook and the Zoom for um, there's a playlist on our learning portal that has some uh, fish illustrations that Gavin did. Gavin uses illustration in his work as a biologist. And um, so they're anatomically correct. You can uh, print them off just for their own beauty they're, they're or close. you can they're color close. them in. They're, they're close. They're close yeah. He's, <laughs> disclaimer, they're pretty close. They're great <laughs> for coloring. And uh, yeah, so uh, the link is going in right now and then you can um, print them off and color them. 
So there's really only one other fish in here that I'd like to flag because they were easy to catch. And here he is. Oh. See, he's stuck to the glass. Oh, oh yeah. That is a clingfish. And our clingfish are weird because, I hope he stays upside down, uh -huh. their pelvic yeah. girdle and their pectoral fins all combine to form a suction cup. So these guys, kind of like a chitin, can stick to rocks even when the, the surf is pounding in here. So they're, they're basically, let's see if they'll stick to the glass. It's one of those amazing adaptations for living out here. Eh? Yeah, these guys cannot, you have to be so gentle trying to move them because mm. when they're stuck, they're really, there he is. So oh, he, oh, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, let he's, me just. He's stuck to the <laughs> glass there. Oh, yeah. Nice. And so if you're, if you're, oh, that guy's got a little infection on him. That's interesting. Um, so if you're not very gentle with those guys, you can, you can do them a lot of damage trying to pry them off a rock. And so I, I usually recommend if you see them, great. If they drop off, have a look at them, but don't try to pry them up because you'll probably do more damage than good. Right. And you bring up a good point when we're out here exploring, you know, it's okay to have a look you know, have them in a tank for a little bit, but then put, put them back and just be really gentle with your, and, and, you know, also be careful with your hands, right? Because our hands have salt and oil on them. And so not great for, for animals that live in the ocean. Yeah, if you have a gas powered car, there might be gasoline on it. Yeah. No, we don't. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the other thing, that little um, uh, clingfish that I showed you here yeah. is a teeny one. This is a big one. Oh, okay. He's over triple the size, but because he's so big, I can't get him to pry up. Oh, yeah. So you, you wouldn't know, want to damage him. Yeah, yeah. Is relative, that... That, that's a good size. Okay. I've seen two of them that big here today. So that's a, that's a good size teammate. for them. Come on. I'm going to irritate you just a bit, make you move. Come on. You know you want to swim up into my hole. <laughs> you know. No, okay, no. that's not me. Well, I wonder if this is a good time to look at those invertebrates that sure. you found, and we could get Heidi uh, I'll, to... I'll flip the fish into the other tub okay. so we can put the invertebrates into here. All right, we've got a whole operation going on here. And then we can just... Whoop, come on, you. That's teamwork. That's awesome. So why wouldn't we want to leave those fish in there, Gavin? Uh, there's really no problem. They're just hogging the scene. Oh, bit. okay. <laughs> it's just for visual clarity. Yeah. I was thinking it might go after them, but no, maybe not when we're out. hovering. No. No, I don't think there, there would be any prediction happening here. But... Whoops. And they're slipping. Yeah, we, we didn't catch that on camera. I said it'd be a miracle if either one of us didn't slip today. Super Come slippery. On. Okay. You know what? He's probably, He's probably fine. Out. Okay. So, Heidi, we've got, we told you what Gavin found. I, I didn't go for anything crazy rare. I just got the common stuff. <laughs> so Heidi's expertise is in, in marine invertebrates. And so this is animal that Gavin has found is an invertebrate. So it's an animal without a backbone. Okay, the anemone dropped off. Oh. <laughs> and it's got a very interesting body structure. It's got, actually, I didn't count them. How many is it, appendages has it got, Gavin? Which one? Oh, the big one? The big one. Uh, five. Five. So any guesses what Gavin's going to pull out of that? Ooh. Oh, there's a little, oh, I didn't see that one. Okay, I'm going to look at the little one. Oh, gorgeous. Oh, I didn't see that one either. So cool. Okay, I can't wait to hear what Heidi's going to say about this once we get, oh, Gavin's slipping. This is, this is the beauty of the RBCM outside. You never know what's going to happen. Okay, I'm going to dump so some of this water in here. This is kind of, okay. this feels, uh, oh, but maybe it's my hand. A little bit warm. Oh, about the same. Okay, here's, I'll just carry this one out so people can see okay. it. Okay, and then Heidi, we're going to get you to wax poetic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, gorgeous. All right, what Gavin has in his hand is a leather star sea star. Um, so this is one of the, uh, you can find these in the intertidal. And Gavin, does it smell like anything to you? We're at Clover Point, Heidi. <laughs> yeah, it so, does smell metallic to me. So sometimes people say that they find this sea star smells a bit like garlic, funny enough. I, I gotta try it. Of, yeah. <laughs> one of, it's one of the sea stars that also yeah. kind of has that, that slimiest kind of back. Um, yeah. 
yeah our oil surface um, and if gavin turns it over again sea stars are very interesting those circular things that you're seeing there those are called tube feet so how they move around is they basically have hundreds to thousands of tiny little suction cups that they can use on a hydraulic system to move around and they also can catch food and they pass it to the middle of their body and they can actually stick their stomach out of their mouth pretty crazy wow. to yeah. help digest things so um they can do things with those sucker teeth like pull open my, um bivalves and then stick their stomach in the bivalve like a mussel or a clam and <laughs> digest their food that way so they're pretty incredible animals um and yeah wow so and what's the, the leather star leather star okay this little spot yeah. here is the filter for the water vascular system that controls the tube feed so it's called the madreporite yeah so that draws the water in and like Gavin yeah. says it he acts as a filter so nothing big gets in there that would you know damage their their internal structure. It, it's interesting to me that uh, it's in that location. You know, it's like off center. What? Why yeah. is it? Why is it there, Heidi? Do you know? Probably a ring of. Oh, okay. Yeah. There. Yeah. So Gavin is very right around uh, the water vascular system. There's a circle kind of around the middle of their. I don't know. I don't think I'm on video, but I just made a circle with my hands. <laughs> a circle around, and then um, the digestive system's more central. So that's probably. Oh, okay. Exactly okay. it, and then next that yeah. way. But um, yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah. Great. Right. Okay. Thanks. I'll move this guy Thanks, back Gavin. In. Okay, Gavin's going to move that back in, and I'll go into the tank here with the camera, and you can uh, tell us what's in here. There's some really gorgeous things in here. Hang on. Okay. Um, mm. That little spiky ball down there in the corner, the green little thing. Yeah. It's the green urchin. And um, urchins, there's three main species that we have on our coast, and they're funnily enough go by their names, the green, the red, and the purple urchin. <laughs> and this is another animal that um, is a algae eater. So it goes along and it has a specialized structure called an Aristotle's lantern that they use to scrape and feed algae. And what's really interesting on the BC coast is for a while, um, it's one of its main predators, the sea otter was extirpated, which means it no longer existed here. And what they found was some very interesting consequences was that urchin populations took off and created kelp forest barrens. So these animals were able to eat like whole forests of, um, of kelp forest because they didn't have uh, there's the mat, the Aristotle's lantern at the bottom there. Right, right. Yeah, and so it's one of these amazing cascading effects because we lost the sea otter, then the urchins took off, and then the kelp forests were taken away. And kelp forests are um, habitat to so many different animals, especially mm -hmm. um, concern for us are like nursery grounds for a lot of fish species. So. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those amazing things, but I mean, it's hard to tell from that cute little spiky ball all the things that can go on, isn't it? Yeah, that is amazing. Yeah. So Liz, Liz and Heidi, we have a question. What is the name of the sea star with the most tentacles? Um, the most arms, I'm wondering if they mean. Um, yeah, most so, arms, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so usually that, that species here, most sea stars on our coast have five. I believe we see in that tank one that has six, if not two. Um, and then there's ones that usually have 15 or more, and those are called Pycnopodia, or the sunflower star, sea star. And those are usually quite large um, sea stars, and they're pretty fast predators for sea stars. So thank you for that question. Yeah, like um, look how fast this one's moving. Yeah. Now that one's a six-armed sea star. Their genus is called Leptosterius. Um, again, they're I, similar biology to that um, other sea star we saw, but one thing I, that's neat about them, I'll tell you, is that most sea stars reproduce by, um, if you think about living in the water column, they just shoot their gametes, their eggs and their sperm into the water, and they just hope that they meet and that they you know, make babies and that they survive in the water column. But Leptosterius is one of the few species that will actually brood their babies. And one of the last times I was at um, Clover Point, I found a bunch of the little babies on the rocks. It was really cute. Oh. Just a little, oh. Yeah, so. I'll be on the lookout for that. Thanks, Heidi. Yeah. Okay, I gotta ask, what is this gorgeous yellow creature over here? 
this thing? That yeah. is called nudibranch. So nudibranchs are also called sea slugs. So they're closely related to snails, but they don't have any shell that you can see. They've lost their shell through evolution, oh, basically. Okay. And they Sorry. have really cool other adaptations to deal with that. So um, they have their gills on their back and they're bright colored and they're just soft and squishy. And you could probably think, oh my gosh, how does it protect itself? They have armed themselves with all sorts of like toxic chemicals from eating um, and the spicules and the, um, the stinging cells from things like anemones. Um, and so nudibranchs are very, very cool. And they're often one of the more bright animals of the intertidal um, world. And it's because it's almost like that um, episomatic coloring, like that warning, like, hey, I am bright yeah. and colorful because I am, Oh, and there you can see at the front, there's two little horns, kind of looking yeah. things. Those are called rhinophores. That's how it like senses an environment. It can get direction and taste and all that sort of thing from those those two things. And then at the back are its gills, and that's how it breathes. Is that feathery kind of plume at the back there? Oh yeah, oh, you can, I hope I hope you can see that a little bit. When you hold still, it's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So and then we, okay, go ahead. We are getting close on time, but the only other thing I thought I'd bring up is that crab that you have there in front. Mm -hmm. It's called a porcelain crab, and porcelain crabs are not as common to find. But what's fantastic about them is that they, even though they have those gorgeous big claws, they actually have really interesting mouth parts that are almost um, that they can use to filter feed food out of the water column. And then they're also one of these animals that if Gavin were really rough with it, which thankfully he isn't being now, it will drop its arm and run away. Like it, it's quite the protective um, uh, instinct and it can just shed and grow back its claws like nothing. It's incredible. That and is incredible. You, yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I know we're close on time. So the only other thing, do you want me to bring up the watersheds? Oh, yes, about the, yeah, the theme for today for Ocean Week is watersheds. Yes, Heidi, thank you. Okay, so just as a little heads up, watersheds, um, where they are, mostly the water isn't part of a major watershed. It, um, it will just run into the ocean and into the culverts and waste fluid we have, so we always have to be mindful of that. But they're pretty close to, close to a water system. We have um, a watershed called Bowker Creek water system. And actually through the museum, we've got an incredible learning portal. I won't show it to you right now, but I put the link in. That's mostly done through Oak Bay High School. And they've done some incredible resources on what it means to be um, restoring um, watersheds and how watersheds are connected to the ocean and all that sort of fantastic stuff. So even though we're on the beach right now, it's important to think about what we're doing in our communities and our watersheds. So um, yeah. Yeah, Any thank you questions? for that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for mentioning that, Heidi. Yeah, and there are some great playlists on our learning portal. That's, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Oak Bay High has contributed quite a few playlists to the learning portal, and they're, they're fantastic. So I encourage everybody to go on and have a look at all the work of the students there on Bowker Creek and that watershed, really critical watershed in our area. Um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, we're almost at time, but we can certainly take some more questions if there's any. I... I I gotta ask, what is the bright orangey red one? Is that another an anemone? Yeah. An anemone. What was the song, Gavin? <laughs> anemone. <laughs> what is that, Heidi? Yeah, yeah it's uh, an anemone. You're very right. I'm actually having troubles with the color in the view to actually mm. tell you what it is. Yeah. Um, but what I can tell you about anemones is that they're very cool animals in that they have all those tentacles at the top that they use to um, sting and grab prey. And what you can't see on a microscope level is that they're literally, like if you ever touched an enemy in, in, the, um, in the intertidal, it almost feels like a bit sticky when you touch it. What's actually happening on a microscope level is they're sending tiny little barbs into you. <laughs> it's just that you have thick enough skin that it doesn't hurt. But if you can imagine you're a tiny little prey item for them, it, it um, yeah, they can sting and grab their um, prey items. And then what they do is they pull it into their mouth and they have a big digestive system in them. And then they have to actually shoot it back out their mouth. So their mouth doubles as their you know what. <laughs> yeah. 
that and it, you know it's really beautiful color from here yeah, it's more on the red side than a brown yeah mm -hmm. heidi we have another question from the chat uh, Patricia asks, have sea stars uh, been recovering from the wasting disease? Yeah, the wasting disease is a really fascinating thing that happened along the BC coast. A virus took off in these populations, which is kind of fascinating to think about in the context of our world right now. Um, it hit certain species harder than others, um, definitely the ones that tend to uh, congregate in groups, and also some sea stars um, feed on other sea stars. So those uh, species got it more than others. Uh, I, we have been seeing recovery in some areas and some species more than others. And it's uh, one of these things that it's gonna take time, um, not back to regular levels, but recovering, yes. But they have also seen outbreaks of the disease again, which is again quite interesting if we're thinking about our world right now. So um, not nearly as devastating as it has been uh, that one year. Um, but uh, that year was probably aggravated by ocean warming. Um, and yes, so that's, there's definitely um, resources out there you can look into, but um, my cautious answer is yes, but slow and not in a uh, like, uh, like, oh my gosh, there was nothing that ever happened. It's just, it's a slow to rebound system for sure. Thanks, Heidi. Mm -hmm. So, um is there any more questions or if not i think we're going to sign off although i'm going to get to a little bit of a prettier spot here can we quickly clip that rock and see if those fish are let's under? let's do it <laughs> let's do it gavin wants to show you the action <laughs> oh. now, this this rock here is on land There's just a little bit of water around you ready? Okay, so kind of. And there you have fish. As easy as that. <laughs> Whoop, there's another one. And Gavin's being very careful not to let that rock down on oh, no. those animals. No, that's when I put the rock back, I'm very careful to put something down. Oh, there's a teeny, doesn't... teeny little grub right over yeah. here. Looks like a frog. The, under, the, the sad thing Oops, about intertidal yes. walking is this, there's life everywhere. There's little shore crabs, there's isopods, there's shrimp, and it's, it's hard to walk anywhere, even on barnacles, without causing some damage. So the, the trick is to tread as lightly as you can and uh, limit your impact. But that is really quite something, what, yeah. what was under that rock. Yeah, no, this is an amazingly diverse... Sponges. Oh, yeah. There's, there's snails here. See, we could keep going we and totally going. going. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to turn the camera around. And... Uh, Gavin's going to stand up and say goodbye. He's putting the rock down. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. And if you have questions that we miss, um, you can contact us through our emails that you'll see on the site. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us and hope to see you next week. Happy Oceans Week. Bye, everybody. Awesome. Bye.